The fundamental theorem of algebra says that the largest exponent in a polynomial tells you the number of real and complex zeros that the polynomial has. Let's go back and look at the quadratic equation. When we graphed quadratics, one of three things happened. Either the graph touched the x-axis twice, in which case we said it had two real solutions. Or the parabola only hit the x-axis once. Well, we call that one real solution, or we now know that that is a polynomial whose factor has a multiplicity of two. And then the third thing that could happen is you could graph the parabola and it has no real solutions. We also learned that that was the same thing as saying that it had two complex solutions. That means that the answers were imaginary. So the fundamental theorem of algebra says that there's always going to be two solutions. They could be real, they could be complex, they could be a combination of both. Now let's kind of go and look at the cubic function. And for the cubic function, we're going to specifically look at this shape. So when I go and graph that on the coordinate plane, my cubic function could look like this. It could have three zeros. But I can also draw this so that it only has two zeros. But notice that this one here has a multiplicity of two. I could draw it so that it has one solution. So if it has one real solution, the other two solutions must be complex. These are the only things that can happen when you draw a cubic function. There's no way of drawing this so that it never hits the x-axis. The reason for that has to do with the end behavior. Notice that the end behavior for cubic functions is always one side up, one side down. When that happens, then the graph has to hit the x-axis at least once. So any odd degree polynomial will have at least one real zero. If you look back at the quadratic, notice that both ends are up, or if I flip this upside down, both ends are down. When you have an even degreed polynomial, it could hit at least, or at the least amount it could hit is zero times. Odd powers has to hit at least once. Even powers doesn't have to hit at all. So let's do an example of finding all of the roots of a polynomial. In order to find all the roots of x to the fifth minus x to the fourth minus 3x cubed plus 3x squared minus 4x plus 4 equals 0, we need to start by graphing it in our calculator. After we graph it, we want to find the real zeros. Where does the graph hit the x-axis? Well, you're going to notice after you're done graphing it that it hits at negative 1. I'm sorry, negative 2. It hits at positive 1 and positive 2. But it's a fifth degree polynomial. There should be five zeros. So then I go back and I look at the graph and I ask myself, are there any multiplicities? Do any of those zeros appear to have a quadratic or a cubic shape? They don't. That means that the other two zeros must be imaginary. How am I going to go find them? Well, the way we're going to go about finding them is we're going to use polynomial division to divide out all three of these zeros. When I get rid of all three of these zeros using polynomial division, I will be left with a quadratic equation. I will use the quadratic formula to solve it. The only way to find our complex or imaginary zeros is using the quadratic formula. So this is how I'm going to start. I'm going to start with the first zero. I'm just I work from left to right. I'm going to start with this one. And then that goes in my box. Next to my box go the coefficients from the original polynomial. Don't forget to ask yourself, are there any missing terms? There are not. So I have 1, negative 1 negative 3, 3, 
negative 4 and 4. So I get 1, negative 2, add going down, multiply, add going down, multiply, add going down, multiply, add going down, multiply, add going down. The last number should always be 0 because we found out that when the graph hits the x-axis or that factor will always give you zero as a remainder when you divide it out. All right, now I'm going to move this up because now I'm going to go to the next zero. And it's going to go in the box next to the quotient here. Notice the line only goes up until the remainder. This was x to the fifth, so this quotient was x to the fourth. Every time you divide out a term, the power of the quotient goes down by 1. All right, let's do synthetic division again. Bring down the 1. Multiply, add. Multiply, add. Multiply, add. Multiply, add. Hey, look, I got 0 again. All right. Now, this is x to the third we need to divide out my last term here. So now I'm going to put 2 in a little box, put my line, 1, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. The last quotient is 1x squared plus 0x plus 1. So basically it's x squared plus 1. So that's a factor, x minus 2, x plus 2, and x minus 1. Look, there are the factors. And then for the solutions, we already knew three of the solutions to find the other one. Actually, this one's nice. I don't even have to use the quadratic formula, although you could. Or you can remember that the square root of negative 1 is i. So these are my other two solutions. If you use the quadratic formula, x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, then your a would be 1, b would be 0, and c would be 1. Let's do this again. But let's rephrase the question. What are the zeros of f of x equals x to the fourth plus x cubed minus 7x squared minus 9x minus 18? This is the same thing as the question I asked in the last problem. I want to find all the solutions. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to graph this in my calculator and find where it hits the x-axis. So I graph and find the zeros, and we're going to find out the zeros are at negative 3 and positive 3. So there's two of the solutions. Wait a second, but this is a fourth degree polynomial. The fundamental theorem of algebra says there are four solutions. What are the other two? So I go back and I look at the graph again to make sure there are no multiplicities. Neither of these zeros has a quadratic or cubic shape. So the other two solutions must be imaginary. So the way I'm going to find them is I'm going to start with one of the two zeros and I put it in a box. Next to it go the coefficients from the original polynomial, making sure there are no missing terms, which there are not, and then doing polynomial division. So 1, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add, try that again, and then multiply, add, and you should get 0. Now, since this was x to the 4th, this is x to the 3rd. Now I'm going to use the next zero, and I'm going to divide it out of this quotient. The remainder better be zero. One, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. So this must be 1x squared plus 1x plus 2. So now to find the other two solutions, we're going to use the quadratic formula. A is 1 b is 1, c is 2. So x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac 
all over 2a. Remember that I want you to simplify this in parts. So x is equal to negative 1 plus or minus the square root of negative 7 all over 2. And the only other thing you have to do is take the i out. And here are the other two solutions. Negative 1 plus i square root of 7 over 2. And the other one is negative 1 minus i square root of 7 over 2. So in this lesson, we have combined several things that we know how to do now into one problem. We know how to graph polynomials to find real solutions. We know how to determine multiplicities. We know how to do polynomial division, specifically synthetic division, to divide zeros out of the original polynomial to get it down to a quadratic equation. And we know how to use the quadratic formula. So I realized that this problem may have been lengthy, but there wasn't a single thing in it that we had not already accomplished.